Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Youth-Centered Civics Initiatives to Strengthen Communities. We're excited to be co-hosting this webinar today with the Institute for Citizens and Scholars to discuss their Civic Spring project and share out their insights on youth-led programs. As we get started, please introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're joining us from. Remember to change your chat box settings to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see where you're coming from. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with all registered attendees, including the resources, including the resources references reference in the presentations. To gather input from our audience, we'll also be sharing a survey link at the end of today's presentation that we encourage you to complete. Um, and the link will also be sent out in our follow-up email. And finally, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So please use the Q and A function at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for our panelists. And with that, I will pass it over to Jay Janeski, Chief Communications and Engagement Offer at Citizens and Scholars. Thank you and greetings to everyone joining today and a special thank you to After School Alliance for hosting the conversation. I'm Jay Janeski and I'm from the Institute for Citizens and Scholars and we are really proud to share the learnings of our Civic Spring project with you all today, but really mostly to engage with you in a rich conversation around youth-led programming in the after-school space. But before I dive in, let me first introduce you to our incredible moderator and panelists. Uh, just to keep things fast and simple, we'll have them have each panelist introduce themselves and just quickly note their role in the project. Uh, Andrew, let's start with you. Hi, my name is Andrew Brennan. I'm an education fellow with National Geographic, and I have to co-chair the Civic Spring Project Community of Practice, uh, which is an intergenerational group uh, that met throughout the project. Great. Ruby, over to you. Hi, I'm Ruby. I'm a research assistant at Circle, and we helped to evaluate the Civic Spring Project. And Allison? I'm Allison Cohen, and I'm an affiliated researcher with Circle and part of the evaluation team. And Christian from Circle. Unless I skipped that person. Okay, so let's go over to Griffin. Hello, um, I'm Griffin. Um, I'm one of the Civic Spring Project grantees. I'm from Elizabeth, New Jersey. And Emma. Groundwork, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Groundwork, Elizabeth. Yes. Emma, go ahead. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm from Kentucky Student Voice Team, and we are also grantees of the Civic Spring Project. I believe, last but not least, is Pragya. Hi, I'm Pragya. I am a rising senior in Lexington, Kentucky, and I'm also a member of the Kentucky Student Voice Team. Great. And then I see Christian's back on. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Christian. I'm also with the Circle team that did the evaluation, and I'm very excited to be here. Great. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. and. Looking forward to having a good chat with you in just a bit. So why don't we first introduce um, the scenario here. So for the last 75 years or so, CNS, our organization, has prepared leaders uh, to meet really urban, urgent education challenges inside and outside of the classroom. You might know us by our former name, which is the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation. Last year, we changed our name and expanded our mission to focus on developing citizens who are well-informed, productively engaged and hopeful about democracy. So when it comes to engaging with young people, we think beyond the high school civics class. We focus on what we call civic learning, which definitely includes learning about our history and our public institutions, but it also includes practicing civic skills and dispositions like using one's voice, debating respectfully with others, and developing a sense of responsibility to your community. Most importantly, we need to give young people a seat at the table to co-create solutions that positively impact their community. And that's what we wanna dive into today. So we're here to discuss the evaluation and the learnings from our out of school pilot project we launched last summer called the Civic Spring Project. Uh, that project we made grants to six youth-centered organizations around the country and across the political spectrum. The projects aim to address local challenges brought on to, by the pandemic, but they also uh, addressed promoted or addressed or promoted local participation 
in the 2020 presidential election. So we've got a few of those incredible grantees with us today, and they're going to share their experience and their perspectives. So then really there's two things I wanted to introduce us to before we hand it over for the, the conversation. Uh, we brought on the evaluators from Circle, who you were just introduced to, to help us evaluate our theory that the out of school space can help young people grow their civic skills and also interact with people from diverse backgrounds and beliefs. And the evaluators will share more on this later, but I thought there's two notable findings that I wanted to bring out right in the beginning of the conversation. The first is here that you see on the screen that significant civic learning can happen outside of the classroom. So this is particularly poignant right now since education accountability metrics at the state and the local levels are leaving very little time during the actual school day for civic learning and any SEL work. And that brings us to the second learning that I wanted to share, which is that program participants measurably strengthened their social emotional learning capacities. They were able to navigate both civic institutions and their mental health and they develop strategies for working with stakeholders across lines of difference. So this really does show that this is more than just about acquiring knowledge. Um, I really hope that these findings and the conversation that we're about to have will help you better design youth-led programming, um, especially programming that impacts young people directly and our communities. This is a particularly critical time to prioritize this, especially with the federal stimulus money that's been set aside for after school programming. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Andrew to guide us through the next part of this conversation. And a big thank you again to everybody joining us today. Andrew, over to you. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Jay. And I am really excited to uh, introduce um, several speakers who are going to speak to uh, a lot of what uh, you just outlined, and, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, thank you also, everyone, for joining us. Um, I will take issue with uh, one thing Jay said at the very end, uh, which is that uh, you all should be uh, not necessarily creating uh, programming for youth, but co-creating programming uh, with youth. And I think uh, that theme is something that will uh, be threaded throughout today's conversation. Um, so I, I want to um, just quickly uh, take a step back. Uh, again, my name is Andrew. I'm an education fellow with National Geographic. Uh, my role there is to support youth-led movements and organizations all around um, the world. Uh, and one of the things that's a, a big part of my job that is so uh, amazing is the ability to meet with and to learn from young people who are already on the front lines uh, solving problems in their community uh, and strengthening democracy in ways that go beyond just, uh, I think, what the media likes to elevate sometimes. I mean, truly, um, young people are leading research initiatives uh, to uncover uh, problems in their communities, challenges facing their schools that adult researchers can't figure out because they don't know the right questions to ask. Um, they're telling stories in which they're able to elevate the experiences of their classmates into halls of power where decisions are being made because they have unique relationships uh, with those in their community, their peers. Um, and I've seen young people stop legislation in its tracks uh, by enlisting their abilities to use technology and to build coalitions uh, to push back uh, on systemic policies that don't support uh, them, things like uh, racial justice and uh, climate change. But what I'm really excited though about this conversation um, is that finally young people, um, is, excuse me, adults are realizing that, oh, it seems that young people are, are gaining civic skills and dispositions while they are fighting for the systemic change uh, that our society needs. And so how can we capture and measure and to understand that. Um, and I do just wanna point out uh, the young people who are doing this, who are participating in leading research initiatives, young people who are uh, leading initiatives like the Sunrise uh, Movement and, and Black Lives Matter are doing so in the face of institutions like our public schools um, that uh, relegate too many of their voices to the margin, that do not honor the agency uh, that young people can bring to the table 
uh, frankly, as, as, as humans. And so when you think about this work, um, I, I, I want everyone to think about it both in terms of the impact on the young people themselves, but also the systemic changes that you're starting to ignite as you shift power, whether it's within your organizations or within school systems to young people um, themselves. But something also that I think is important to point out, especially for those of you on this call uh, who are over the age of 35, um, is that young people are not doing this by themselves. Um, young people are leading movements, but they're also learning from adults uh, and they're working together. Um, some of the examples that we'll highlight today throughout the conversation uh, demonstrate the power of intergenerational partnerships. And I, and I, and I hope that people uh, take that to heart. Um, there are things that young people, uh, uh, aspects of our lives that uh, make it challenging um, for us to lead organizations. For example, we graduate every four years, um, but there's also things about adults that make it challenging uh, for them to truly design programs that are equitable and inclusive. For example, the fact uh, that the vast majority of executive directors, teachers, superintendents, and principals in this country are white. Um, and so what we're trying to do here is just to uh, acknowledge and to elevate uh, the work that young people are capable of uh, when we honor the agency uh, that they bring to the table. Um, what we're acknowledging here is that there's the in-school versus out-of-school debate, um, but that like what young people can bring to the table in terms of helping to co-design uh, initiatives, helping to lead research projects, helping to crowdsource diversity and inclusion curriculum that reflects their identities. Uh, we're shifting power in a way uh, that honors the agency young people bring to the table and also treats them like the citizens we are trying to develop. Our schools are meant to be incubators for our democracy. Um, and so if we want schools, if we want uh, a society uh, that uh, where, where uh, citizens are engaged and critically have agency over their lives, over their decisions. We need to be starting with that um, with young people when they're in school. So I think that's the opportunity that the Civic Spring Project hopes to continue to elevate. Uh, and hopefully some of the themes uh, that you'll be able to pick, on over, pick up on um, over the course of the rest of the webinar. Um, and so with that, I think I can uh, introduce the circle team and welcome them to share some of their findings. They're amazing folks and I really love working with them. So I'll turn it over. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so we can go back to the slides too. So just to start off, for those of you who may not be familiar, CIRCLE stands is the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement. And it, we're a nonpartisan independent research organization that's focused on youth civic engagement in the United States. And so our role here was both working with each of the grantee organizations within the Civic Spring Project, so all six of them on individual evaluations and also on evaluating the overall effort. Um, it was a lot of work that we did. We're not gonna be going into in depth on all of our findings, um, including on each of the grantee specific impact. We're just gonna be talking about some pretty high level Findings And so Christian and Ruby are going to be diving into that and we'll also put a link to the full report in the chat. So Sarah just put that in there for those of you who are curious about learning more. Thanks. Christian, do you uh, want to? Yeah, sounds good. So thank you, Allison, for um, introducing that. And as Allison mentioned, there were so many takeaways and learnings, both for us, for citizens and scholars and for the grantees themselves. And so we can only really scratch the surface in the time that we have here. But one of the first things we wanted to talk about was how out of school civic learning experiences can allow for time, flexibility and depth to advance equity, promote civic learning, but then also optimize impact. So when we're measuring impact, 
we first wanted to define and measure civic learning in a broad and inclusive way, as Andrew and Jay mentioned. Civic learning can include facts about how governments and other groups operate, but also the development of a range of civic skills, including social emotional learning capabilities, but also young people's abilities to navigate civic institutions and their strategies for working with stakeholders. So from a broader and more inclusive definition of civic learning, what we find is that these extracurricular experiences empowered young people, not just to gain these civic skills and gain the civic learning, but also to make a deep and wide ranging impact upon their communities. And that is one of the key findings that we wanted to talk about today is just the sheer breadth and depth of the impact that all of the grantees made upon their communities and all of the change that they affected. So from our data, we found that 61% of all participants said they often or very often helped make their city or town a better place. 90% agreed or strongly agreed that the Civic Spring project helped them find or strengthen their own voices. Every participant said that they pushed themselves to do something that was hard for them, or that they did something very well and that seemed impossible. And then 86 and 79% of participants in September and December iterations of our evaluation survey agreed or strongly agreed that the Civic Spring initiative helped them gain important life skills, such as taking care of their mental health. So as we can see, there was a tremendous impact made upon participants in the Civic Spring project, not just upon themselves, but also the impact that they made upon their communities. And so that's really key because when we look at this broader definition of civic learning, we can see that impact stretches very deep beyond just the participants into communities as a whole. So next, I want to turn it over to Ruby Bell Booth, our colleague at Circle, who will talk about some other key findings from our evaluation. Thanks, Christian. Um, the next key finding we really wanted to highlight was how paramount paying young people for their time and expertise is in improving access to civic opportunities and making such opportunities more equitable. For a lot of grantees, the Civic Spring funding allowed existing and new staff members, including young people, to dedicate a meaningful portion of their summer working on intensive civic work because they were paid. Paying young people for their time makes it possible for more youth and more diverse youth, especially from working class and low socioeconomic backgrounds, to participate in all the amazing work that Andrew and Christian outlined. Beyond this, paying young people shows young people that their work in civic spaces is valuable. Helping to make young people feel valued in their communities is so important in supporting youth civic development and for creating sustainable community change. And I think one of the major things we've learned from Civic Spring is that the more foundations that are willing to back young people and support them monetarily will help to really deepen the ability for young people to create civic change in their communities. And another area that we spent a lot of time thinking about and evaluating was the Civic Spring Community of Practice, which was a group that convened monthly to, um, to talk about the challenges that were being faced to collaborate, to support one another, and it was composed of both adult and youth members from all of the grantee organizations. And this community of practice showed the really exciting potential that communities of practice have in the youth-driven civic space. Bringing groups together across age, geography, and experiences allowed for reflection, support, and problem solving that was a new and rewarding experience for participants of all ages. And this example that Civic Spring set, we have learned so much about what it takes to create an effective community of practice that both makes participants feel valued and supported and like the time that they're spending on the community of practice is actually an asset to their busy schedules. And one really unique feature of this community of practice was that it was intergenerational and it allowed for some really incredible intergenerational partnerships as well as um, while still promoting youth leadership. And I think one thing that allowed this to happen was that the community of practice had both intergenerational spaces where people of all ages could share their experience and expertise with the group. And there were also spaces organized by shared experiences, which allowed young people to have the safety and trust necessary to have more honest conversations about the unique struggles that they face in doing civic work that is inter intergenerational. And despite this really incredible intergenerational success of the community of practice, there were also tensions between the youth and adult participants because of power imbalances that are inherent to this kind of intergenerational work. 
And one recommendation we had to ease some of these tensions is increased intentionality and transparency in the goals and structures of a community of practice. This can help to clarify expectations and roles, allowing for participants to feel more comfortable participating. And then on top of that, as the Civic Spring facilitators, including Andrew found, it is critical to be able to be flexible in planning, allowing for an inviting ongoing co-design and revision with participants, especially with young participants based on their needs and interests. And lastly, the success of a community of practice is only as strong as the community that is built. As we found 70% of participants said that it was important or very important to feel a sense of community within the Civic Spring community of practice. And based on this, it's so important to make sure that deepening social and professional connections is a major emphasis of future communities of practice. The community of practice for the Civic Spring Grant showed the profound potential that these communities of practice have in the civic space, especially when they're implemented with intentionality, transparency, co-design with youth, and deep cross-organizational community and collaboration. And we think that the creation of longer-term communities of practice in the youth-driven civic space um, that have the time and resources to prioritize all of these valuable lessons learned from the Civic Spring community of practice is going to be a really incredible way to deepen this youth-led civic work. And unless Allison or Kristen have anything to add, I think I'll pass it back to Andrew. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that presentation. I get so excited whenever I see uh, presentations from you all because it's just, you all are so great. And I just want to also elevate, um, I, you know, we do, there is more need for phil philanthropic support of this work, as you pointed out. Um, young people throughout this country, throughout history, have been on the forefront of these movements, but are still not enjoying uh, the kind of support commiserate with the impact that they're having. So I appreciate you elevating that as part of your presentation as well. Um, so thank you. Um, and now we're going to transition to hear from uh, several of the grantees, which I'm really excited for. Um, so I just want to welcome Griffin uh, Mendonca and Emma Nesmith and Pragya uh, Ubredi up onto the stage. Um, and I think what we will do is if each of you could just introduce yourselves um, and talk a little bit about uh, your role uh, within uh, the Civic Spring Project uh, maybe we could start there and then uh, see where that takes us. So um, Griffin, would you like to kick things off? Yes, thank you, Andrew. And thank you to all of the other speakers before. Um, definitely, Andrew has a point. Y'all are always fantastic circle. Um, yeah, so hello, my name is Griffin. Um, I'm from Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, and actually, Elizabeth and one other place in Jersey got a grantee, which was really, really cool. Um, but yeah, so with Groundwork Elizabeth, uh, last summer, I was pretty much the oldest person there. I was 19 at the time. Um, so I kind of had a role that was like, hey, you know, a lot of these younger kids are looking up to you. And, you know, that that was that was a big that was a big thing. I was definitely played a really big part in encouraging them to speak up, encouraging them to, um, you know, want to have these conversations and educate themselves more. Um, further reach out and deepen into their community as far as you know educating each other um especially as young people when it comes to things civically because we're going to be the next people in the seats so you know just like for me it, just being the oldest being kind of the leader of the team i guess if you want to say it um it was it was fun i really enjoyed it and i also i enjoy talking to young people so i think for me that was something really nice that I well, got to. well, Griffin, can I stay with you for just one second? Because I wanted to know, um, like if you could talk at all about like, did the dynamic within uh, your group that you were helping to kind of co-lead, um, mm -hmm. was it different than like the dynamic of like collaborating with your peers within school? Like what was the, like how was that dynamic different? Yeah, um, definitely. I think because, you know, 
with the six week program that we were doing, we, you know, we had a goal, we had a mission, there was something that we were trying to do, we were trying to get tasks done. So it definitely put like a, a pressure on of okay, we got to get to it, you know what I'm saying, we got to get to it. So we really need to put our heads together and work together as a team. I think sometimes when we get in school settings, if there isn't a sense of accountability, if there isn't a time, you know, like, hey, we got to get on it, that stuff can lack a lot. Mm -hmm. And then you notice, you know, a lot of these kids will fall off. So I think that's one thing that I really enjoyed that we about this program, because we were getting paid, we had a time ticking, we had accountability, we had people that were coming to say, what, what are you guys doing? You know, how are we moving forward? So we really as a team had to buckle down and get get it done, you know, so I think not that we can't do that in school, because that's definitely possible. But I, I noticed, especially doing things in school situations, if there isn't a sense of accountability or a good team to lead um, a good group of kids that are like, hey, no, we want to do this. Sometimes those things don't continue. And it's really sad because they always have potential. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I definitely think it's it's helpful when you have good, I want to say, you know, youth leader type people <laughs> because they really do help to inspire these kids. You know, if you're someone, you know, at least in my community, we're, um, you know, a little urban community and it's kind of hard to, you know, believe that there's possibility of change. It's okay. really hard to believe that. Um, so having, you know, people who are maybe a little bit older than you who are like, hey guys, like, I want to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. You are smart. You, yeah. you value your opinion. I value your opinion, yeah. you know? So yeah, if that makes and, sense. And, and sorry, Griffin, it's one more thing. Um, and just for the people who haven't done their homework, um, could you just give like a 30 second overview of what your project was yes. uh, for the last summer, just so for people can be yes, aware? Uh, yes, I got it. I know I got off a little tangent. Um, but yeah, so in the six weeks, um, groundwork we actually started up a youth council um that they now have that's running with the mayor um we spoke to a lot of people um in from jersey a lot of our representatives we got to obviously talk to our mayor and elizabeth we talked to some freeholders we got to, to speak to our council people um we went to a council meeting and actually presented like a huge document with all these um ideas that we were like hey we want to present this to you we think we should start a council we want to talk about this with our water so we we really were able to do a lot and we were able to really get our foot in and speak with a lot of our representatives which was really awesome and that was from you know the adults that we had to help us yes a seat at the table thank you yes. very much griffin well, thank um uh emma do you want to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and also just uh briefly talk about um kind of how you're involved with the kentucky student voice team yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Emma. Um, I'm a rising senior at Danville High School in Danville, Kentucky, um, and I'm also on the Kentucky Student Voice Team. And we really, our main mission is to get students as partners in education decision making. And so that comes across in a lot of ways. Um, personally, I'm involved with our podcast, which is called Get Schooled, and we um, kind of try and share student stories um, especially because a lot of, not everyone can like write an op-ed, not everyone can, um, feel comfortable being like in a, in a really adult dominated space, but just about everyone can talk and tell their story. So we try and uplift, um, stories of students who maybe aren't traditionally represented in this kind of space. Um, we also, as a, as a group, we do a lot of research and I am involved in that research. Um, currently we're starting a second round of interviews from our Coping with COVID project, which was the study that was um, funded by the Civic Spring, Civic Spring Grant. Um, we conducted interviews and a survey um, for students across Kentucky, basically measuring the impact of the pandemic on their education. And so we got a lot of really valuable data from that. And now we are working on a second round of interviews, kind of checking back in with those same students who um, answered the surveys and were interviewed. And, and Emma, just to stick with you for one second, what did you all do with the data? Um, we wrote several reports and we shared on both local and national um, news stations kind of our findings and we used it to advise policymakers and um, education decision makers in terms of like, here's what students are experiencing because of this unprecedented event and here's how we think you should um, support these students and some concrete things you can do to help them through this. I think you're providing, illustrating a perfect example of how uh, when young people are 
uh, leading efforts, they can both uh, have opportunities to develop as individuals, as students, as scholars, um, while also influencing the systems of inequity around them, uh, informing policymakers to help uh, change how decisions are being made. So I really appreciate you illustrating that example, Emma. Um, Pragya, uh, could you introduce yourself, uh, your role in the student voice team? And also, can you speak to what the student voice team is uh, actually <laughs> as well? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Pragya. I'm a rising senior at Lafayette High School in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, and, you know, I really don't think there's a concise way to explain what this Kentucky Student Voice Team is. We, a lot of our work surrounds so many different facets of just what Emma explained, um, you know, research, advocacy, and policy towards creating a more just education system in Kentucky. Um, and a lot of that surrounds in this past year research, which was, of course, funded by the Civic Spring Project. But, you know, when we're not researching, like Emma was saying, we have so much so much of that uplifting of student voices happens on so many different platforms. So um, of course, those are at the heart of what we do at the Kentucky Student Voice Team. But another thing that I think is super important and has kind of shifted you know, the narrative of what we call ourselves now in, in just the past year um, was just you know the fact that we, after eight years of incubation under the Pritchard Committee became an entirely formally formal um, youth led organization. And so now we're called the Kentucky student voice team. But I think I say that just because I think that's, you know, just that narrative in mind is so important to recognize the work that we've been doing. Um, a lot of times it's really easy for us to say that while we are an education justice centered organization, so much of our work recognizes that um, any sort of justice is intersectional in nature. And, and a lot of our work, you know, calls on the fact that, you know, racial injustice and economic disparities and so many different things that have been exacerbated by this pandemic have kind of also played an immensely, you know, prevalent role in students' lives, especially um, with distance learning and so many things that just interrupted um, traditional school. So overall, I think it's, it's really important that we recognize that just because, um, essentially like the overall purpose of us becoming formally independent was just to of advocacy around issues that affected students in the classroom but were not purely or solitarily education justice issues and so you know after reckoning with the hardships of this past year and not only through the research that we piloted that Emma um, alluded to which obviously amplified almost 13,000 voices across our state um, we also felt really deeply connected with things going on in a national scale that affected people from all over our country. So, um, you know, I think the whole this whole feat of becoming an entirely um, independent organization, it's it's big in itself, but it's also exceedingly common. You know, a lot of youth led organizations start off like we did um, because, you know, of the institutional support that they're provided and because they often, you know, at first lack that type of leverage. But um, you know, once they've gained their own footing kind of at the point that we are at now, you know, that could look like receiving grants or leading massive expansive projects all across the state, um, shifting our mission, which is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and so much more, I think independence and more meaningful growth always follows soon after. So I know that was a really long winded answer to your question, but I think that's what's kind of at the core of what we are as an organization and how we've kind of changed in just the past year. No, and I think it's really important to point that out, both because uh, it started as a program within a larger nonprofit, which is where uh, some folks in this call might find themselves now, uh, but also that it kind of has evolved into the iteration where it is now as an independent organization. But the piece I don't want to lose, Praga, if you can just speak to it, um, is the fact that even as an independent organization, the Kentucky Student Voice Team still really relies on these intergenerational uh, partnerships, and I know that you have both the you have the research advisory dream team, uh, as well as uh, our illustrious managing partner Rachel Bell. And if you could speak to that relationship and dynamic at all, yeah. And I mean, I I know that like that's probably one of the biggest facets of our team that I think is at the heart of everything that we do. Obviously, our research was such a big testament to that. Um, coping with COVID was an IRB approved research study, and and to say that in and of itself um, is a big feat. And obviously that would not have been possible without the incredible adult allies that are behind the work that we do too. And I think even beyond research, when we look at um, education justice from a broader perspective, we obviously know that um, 
our democracy thrives when primary stakeholders are an integral part of radically reimagining systems in our country. And um, when we say primary stakeholders in education, we mean young people just as much as we do adult allies that are in the process of that. So, um, you know, I think whether any of the partners that work with us on any facet of, of the Kentucky Student Voice team and um, more specifically within our research, we obviously recognize that a big part of civic um, learning outside of the classroom means, you know, creating those and cultivating those meaningful partnerships. Um, we're, we're recognizing that we're learning both ways, that um, although adults have the expertise, you know, although they have the degrees in, in whatever they do, we obviously have the expertise in being experts of our own education and being students frontline um, in our education system. So I think that, you know, those two facets are so integral to the work that we do. And obviously at the end of the day, while we do integrate so many adults in the process, um, we still stray away from tokenizing young people for their work. Um, we recognize that our work isn't like a check the box mentality where we have young people there, but they aren't doing meaningful things. Um, we know that when we have students and adults working in partnership with one another, we can get so many meaningful things accomplished. And I think coping with COVID was just one example of that. Thank you so much for that. And I just, uh, first of all, I wanna remind everyone that's watching, if you do have questions uh, for the panelists, please drop them uh, using the Q&A function. I'd be happy to, to get to them, although I will, uh, in full disclosure, I have plenty of questions to ask, so uh, I am happy to continue. Um, uh, Griffin, I did just want to uh, go back to you for a second, in part because what I love about the project that you all embarked on over the summer is that you were in this moment where your city was kind of doing this master plan. Um, and you said, okay, but you can't create a master plan for the next decade without talking to the people who will be adults during that decade. So can you speak about like what it meant to engage in that opportunity and specifically, which I think will be helpful for some of the people that are watching, how did participating and kind of in that moment change the perspective of government, of you know, city government and policy for the students uh, that were in your group? Um, great question, Andrew, and thank you for bringing up that because yes, we did look at our 10 year plan um, and we actually made some of our own opinionated revisions of what you want to say of what we think should be added to the 10 year plan. And I think just from my own personal experience, like I have, I didn't even know that like, that's what something that was what cities did. Like, I didn't know that they like plan things like that. Um, so it was very insightful for me to sit down and read this whole thing of like, oh, so that's what they're doing with the water or that's what they're doing with whatever, whatever. Um, and I think for us young people, like we don't really ever get to experience that. Like I said, I didn't even know that that's something that they did. So the fact that I was able to have access to look at that document and, you know, be like, oh, well, this doesn't really make sense because of X, Y, Z or whatever, you know, like it was, it was really insightful for me to see that even as being the oldest person, like I said, I had no idea. Um, so getting to, you know, look at the 10 year plan, go and actually speak to city council about the 10 year plan. And, you know, um, talk to different people in our city who are responsible for our hospital and the water and, um, you know, even talking about things like our light pollution in our city, because we're a little urban city with a lot of light pollution, like those things were all on there. So I think that was it really like brought a different perspective to these kids because we didn't know what to expect when we were going to go in to do this project and do this work so then i think for us to you know sit down and say hey let's look at this 10-year plan because like andrew had mentioned they were literally developing it at the same time and you know updating it so i think for us to you know give our little opinion and give our little you know thoughts and feelings on it was kind of nice to feel like we were included like we had a seat at the table <laughs> and like we you know like listen we want to hear what you guys have to say um so yeah and, and then also just learning the whole educational side of it too like I said there's so many aspects of government that even myself as educated as I am that I do not know you know so just to be included in that and felt like it felt like I was learning something and it, it it made me feel smarter it made me feel like when I was done I was like okay that was something successful you know I didn't feel like I didn't know, or I didn't feel like, oh, I'm in the dark. I felt like, okay, well, this makes sense. And I understand why they're doing this, or I don't really agree with that. 
And I felt like I was able to express that to whoever I was speaking to, you know? Um, so it, it was, it was, it was very nice that we got to look at that 10 year plan. <laughs> But, but can I ask, do you think it would have made a difference if this were a classroom activity with a simulated like city that is doing a theoretical strategic planning process? Like, do you think that, that, that it would have uh, been different to experience it and like, yeah, like in, in that classroom environment Absolutely. versus the real thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, yes, um, I'm all for like Andrew had mentioned, our schools are the incubators. Um, that is definitely an activity that I would have loved to have in high school, but what, I just have it in one assignment and that's it, nothing happens. I don't talk to the mayor. I, didn't, I, I wouldn't have spoken to my councilwoman at large, you know, if it was just an assignment in my class. So I definitely think being able to actually do something with the material and do something with the work that I just did, all the research that I did, and the time that me and you know my team that we put into why we had our certain opinions about what we want to change in the 10-year plan and then delivering it to the mayor that was impactful me just doing the assignment in school yeah it would have been nice i still would have learned absolutely i still would have learned but it it wouldn't have been as rewarding i did all that work for an a yeah i can i know i can get an a i want to tell the mayor <laughs> i want to talk to city council I want to talk to freeholder, whatever his name is. You know what I'm saying? Like that is getting the work done. I want to go and do it. I know I can get an A, but I do think that we need to implement those kinds of things in the classroom because I think as young people, we need to know and be, you know, aware of those. Absolutely. It's not an either or, it's a both, both and. Um. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> but to answer your question in short, yes, I think, I think it would have, it would have been different if it was just an activity in a classroom. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and Emma, I know you were also talking about kind of using the findings from uh, your research to inform uh, actual policy. I guess my question for you is uh, like, can you give us just a sense of like, what are the things that you all were able to uncover uh, through your research that adult policymakers maybe weren't aware of or, or weren't fully aware of? Like how, how were you able to bring uh, added value to those conversations. And Praga, I know you were also very involved with the um, with that research as well, if you wanted to jump in there. Well, so I'd say, you know, to a lot of to a lot of us, the students who were working on this project, the the findings we ended up with seemed kind of obvious because we were we were going through these same experiences. So we were like, yeah, we feel less connected to our teachers. Yes, we feel like our grades have suffered. Yes, we feel like our future plans are unstable. But to ad adults in um, the policymaking space, these things are less obvious. So um, in a lot of, I mean, maybe to me, it seems like, yeah, we kind of discovered the obvious things, but I think there were some surprising things to um, policymakers and decision makers. So a lot of what we found was that students felt like less connected to their teachers. Um, they felt like their grades had suffered because in large part, because their mental health was suffering. Um, which was another big thing we found just being so isolated from their friends and from their community and um, from their school, their physical school had really had a negative impact on their mental health, which in turn made them less motivated, um, made that it made them feel like school doesn't like what's the point school doesn't really matter I don't, I'm just home all day I don't see my friends I don't see my teachers. And you know, back in back in March of 2020, we hadn't really nailed down this distance learning thing. So teachers were struggling too. And so um, it wasn't as like concrete of, you know, a Zoom class and then these assignments, it was just kind of a little bit of a free for all because no one really knew what was going on. And students were definitely being impacted by that in a lot of ways. And in some ways, students were really compassionate on these surveys. Like they didn't, they said, yes, I'm not feeling like my education is meaningful, but I feel for my teachers. I understand that they've never had to do this before and that this is almost as hard for them as it is for me. And so they didn't have um, like any resentment towards their teachers for not knowing how to teach in a pandemic because they understood that this had never been done before. Um, and in a lot of ways they were um, experiencing a lot of just uncertainty um, we had one of our open response questions asked about future plans um, in terms of like 
has the pandemic affected your future plans? How has it happened? And we found that a lot of students um, felt like either their plans had fallen through or they were just kind of adrift and had no idea what to do anymore, um, either because their grades had suffered and so now they weren't sure they would be able to get the scholarships they wanted to, or because you know they hadn't had an athletic season. And so for some kids who are hoping for athletic scholarships, that can really impact your, um, your college options. And so a lot of kids were very worried about that and about um, in general, like being able to get into college still with the way the pandemic had affected their educational experience. Um, and also students who were planning to go into the workforce, a lot of them were saying, well, I need to reconsider what I'm going to do as a job because I've seen my family and my friends and all these people around me um, get laid off or furloughed in the pandemic because they weren't essential workers. And I feel that I need to choose a job that would be considered essential in case of another event like this. Um, and so those were some of the things we said. I know that was a lot. Um, but again, to us, to me and Pragya, this might, this kind of seemed like a little bit obvious, but I think that is why it's so important to have students working on this kind of um, research and this kind of work, because we understand what these other students are going through and we can better communicate it to policymakers and decision makers. Yeah, partnering with students. Uh, I mean, it, it's a resource that sits right in front of everyone uh, that so many people uh, tend to overlook. Um, so we're, we're, we're heading into the, the kind of the last few minutes here. I do want to encourage folks uh, if they have questions or, uh, or, even, or even a comment to, to uh, leave it in the Q&A uh, box. Um, and I don't know, maybe I can actually call on people to speak themselves. I don't know. I'm sure someone, someone will tell me in the chat if, if that's a possibility. Uh, but in the meantime, Pragya, the, the last question I did have for you uh, it's just on this community of practice uh, that we've heard so much about uh, during this call. The idea that uh, throughout the summer, young people across these different projects alongside adult allies were kind of coming together uh, to learn from one another um, and uh, to work with one another. So can you speak to uh, what value uh, you found out of that uh, collaboration and, and what lessons, if any, you took from that? Yeah, of course. So I think in continuing off of almost what Emma had said towards the end that a lot of the things that you know we were often thinking like wow these things are really obvious um on the opposite end of that the things that may not have felt so obvious in that same community that we were working within to kind of you know disseminate all these findings um I kind of I think of it in in terms of two umbrellas so one of them being that our education system is immensely fragile at this moment obviously the few statistics that Emma kind of laid out um, are only small parts of the overall mosaic of student voices across Kentucky that we know that we could have, you know, a, one survey may not have done an entirely holistic job addressing, which is why um, we went on to continue interviews and now are continuing a round two of that because we recognize that um, students likely changed their sentiments on what they felt distance learning was like over the past year. Um, and then the second, you know, Our work overall recognizes that normalcy wasn't working. What we considered normal before the pandemic um, shouldn't be the same way we come back into this work and recognize that you know the students that are at the center the center of our education system they know the disparities that they've dealt with in the past year. They know what's gotten worse throughout this pandemic. Um, you know the same socioeconomic discrepancies, the lack of equitable di distribution of remote learning um, resources, the digital divide, and, you know racial disparities that exist in our schools. So many things that have kind of, um, I guess, percolated throughout this whole our whole education system throughout the pandemic um, have kind of time and time again proven to us that the work that we've done over the past year through this research project and through so many other facets of our work recognizes that we shouldn't go back um, or rush back to what normalcy looked like because in many ways it got us to where we are today. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think when, whenever I think back to the whole community of practice mentality, a lot of these findings that we've unearthed or, or even policy recommendations that we've put together from these findings um, and just from the ways in which we've reckoned with the data that we've collected, or, or just that it's just that wrecking, you know, the ways the ways in which we can present this information to policymakers without um, 
without making it sound like it isn't anything but storytelling, I think is, is so meaningful to the work that we do because we know that um, you know, the one way in which we can make this work feel more meaningful to those that aren't as connected to students as we are um, is to show them that these are the real stories of students that they represent all across the state. So when we look at and call on education policymakers to do something um, with the data that we've collected and with, you know, the constant pushes we have for reform in our education system, we know that that's so deeply rooted in the stories that we've um, spend so much time uplifting. And, and, and another part of our work is just recognizing that um, we're just at the end of the day trying to bridge our schools with our society. We recognize that while so much of this work has happened outside of the classroom, um, we constantly say that civic learning is so meaningful outside of the classroom because we don't have that, you know, textbook mentality of going by the books every single time. And, and we know that the most meaningful types of me, um, intergenerational partnerships can be fueled and sustained and cultivated outside of the classroom. Um, we just know that, you know, if we can create that same environment within our schools, it, I think we have so much um, scope to progress as a society. So overall, I think those the original two buckets of recognizing how normalcy wasn't working um, and that our education system is so fragile. And, and if we connect those two to recognize that we can bridge our schools so meaningfully with our society, um, we can kind of sustain those community of practices beyond our schools. So much I could say in response to that, but I will, in the interest of time, uh, pass it over to Liz Taylor to ask a question. Liz, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself. I'm sorry, I must have hit a button. I didn't have a question. Oh, no problem, Liz. That's no problem at all. Um, and because luckily there is a question in the chat that I think it could be interesting to hear the panel respond to, which is um, one, uh, Frida Sanchez uh, pointed out that a challenge for her organization uh, is getting youth, specifically high school students to show up. Uh, so for the three of you who have run uh, complicated advocacy efforts in your respective communities. How do you get young people to show up? Anyone want to take that on? I think I will say, you know, at, at the center of it is just realizing that in the work that we're doing, first of all, the students that are involved within the Kentucky Student Voice Team are all self-selected. It isn't like, you know, we don't have a, a typical or traditional selection process where we have applications and things like that that overcomplicate things in some ways, especially the types that happen within our schools. Um, we don't have, you know, concrete hierarchical structures. We don't have officer positions. We work in collaboration with each other. Um, and I think even just presenting that to students that we're trying to reach out to to join our work and, and to get involved in the things that we do. Um, it's one of the best ways that we can, you know, really meaningfully bring along other students in the process. We know that um, a lot of times the work that happens within schools is nowhere near or doesn't feel nearly as meaningful. Um, and when I say work, um, it sometimes really only means planning prom or dances that happen within schools that really don't feel anything in comparison to the work that we do outside of school. So yeah, just, you know, continuing that mentality of, of the work or knowing that the work that we're doing is only going to be meaningful when we have students that legitimately want to be there that are, um, you know, compensated for their work, first of all, and, and that have the agency and, and they know that there's going to be people in that community that will listen to them. Um, because I, I don't think I can count very many experiences where within my own school, I felt that same things that I was pointing out. And I, I think I've really found that community outside of school. Emma Griffin, do either of you want to speak to that question as well? Griffin? Yeah, um, I, I, I literally had dropped right in the chat too. I was like, yes, that is a good point because as somebody who personally, um, I have organized a lot in my community on my own time. Um, it is hard sometimes to get some of these kids to show up. It is. And, you know, even now um, I'm actually a youth leader. Um, I'm actually starting a youth council in, in another city here in, in Jersey. And recruitment is something that I'm currently struggling with because it's like, dang, you know, you got to get these kids to show up and, and they're getting paid. We are, we're paying them. But, you know, what I notice is that we have to work on how we empower each other. And I think 
that is at least what I try my best. And that's what I've been doing, you know, specifically just to go back to my example with this recruitment process that I'm in, how can I empower these, these kids? And the first thing is, you know, ask them a question. What is something that you want to see change? What is how, what is something you want to see change in your community? What, what, what do you, what, it, what does the revolution look like for you? What does liberation look like for you? Um, how, you know, empowering these students that way they'll want to show up and they'll want to feel like they're heard because, you know, and speaking again from my personal experience, if you're shut down continuously, if you're told, you know, just be quiet, don't have an opinion on anything, then you're not going to want to participate and have an opinion. Um, so I think definitely reworking how we empower each other, um, making sure that we can give access to these kids, give kids access to this education, you know, and that's what young people need. We need access. We need access. We need outlets. And I say it every time we need access and outlets to creativity, to express ourselves, whether that be through art, through singing, through civic engagement, whatever it is. Um, and that's how you get kids to show up. And of course, hey, we'll pay you for your time because your time is worthy, just like my time is worthy, you know, um, of payment. So I think, you know, definitely how we inspire, inspire each other and, and, and empower these young people like what do you want to see change? And, and like I said, that's just what I've been, that's what I've been trying to implement as I've been recruiting, because I've been noticing it's hard to get them to show up. It's hard because it's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. But once you get them with that one question, what do you want to see? That's how you get them in. What do you want to see? What is, yep. what does liberation look like for you? What is it, what is, what does it look like for you? Because then it's like, oh, wait, now I'm being accountable. What do I want? Do I want change? You know, you have to, you know, ask yourself that. So I definitely, right, yeah. yeah, asking the right questions. I think that's completely <laughs> right. Young people uh, are tasked with thinking critically about everything in school from history to algebra, uh, but never asked to think critically about school itself. When we have roundtable discussions, we always start, what is one thing you would change about your school that the adults in your school building don't know? Those are the kinds of questions uh, that adults should be asking young people um, across the board. Um, and as you're thinking about what it takes to make young people show up, uh, I think, think about the same things it takes to make adults show up. Uh, true fact of the matter is that community organizing is hard. People have busy lives. Um, and so creating a condition that doesn't recreate uh, some of the oppressive conditions in school, it's a great first step, but it's not uh, wholly sufficient. Um, Pragya, there was another question in the chat that I, maybe we could touch on a little bit. Um, talking about just like, what is the, like the logistical realities of youth adult collaboration, given the fact that, you know, adults are on this nine to five, they're hourly, young people are in school, then working at night. Like, how did you navigate the logistics of intergenerational collaboration? Yeah, and I will uplift what I think Rachel just put in the chat. Um, the fact that a lot of our work doesn't necessarily happen in your in your typical traditional, you know, nine to five time. Um, a lot of times our work is, you know, working on legislative policies that we are very strongly against at 12 a.m. and then writing press kits and and media releases and so many things and, and frantically working together as a team because that's really what's at the heart of this this crew. Um, we know that a lot of times, you know, these and I'm, I'm really talking about our Save Our Seats campaign where um, the student and teacher positions on the Kentucky Board of Education were threatened by um, House Bill 178 and you know our team got on it immediately we were up all late at night um, working on so many different facets of that work and so obviously while so much of it still sustained that collaboration um, we recognize that you know some of our most meaningful partnerships even within one another happens when you know everyone else is in bed and and we're you know frantically working to put things together um, and everything worked out perfectly towards the end but we we know that like consistently recognizing and also respecting one another's limits. Because I think um, throughout coping with COVID, we kind of of the moment, but also recognizing that like all of us were students while we were spending so much of our time uplifting the voices of students around us. Um, we were students too. And, and we would spend so long, you know, at school and then coming home and working on research and things like that and, and meetings um, that took a toll on a lot of us. And we kind of started to feel the, the reality of Zoom burnout. And so I think, you know, consistently remaining that, you know, obviously while we were being, holding each other accountable for the work that we were doing because we had so many timelines of different panels and conversations that we had with policymakers and 
um, you know, other parts of the research that kind of demanded that structured. Um, we also needed to kind of lean on one another to hold one another accountable for how we were taking care of ourselves outside of this work. Um, and I think that also goes very well into the intergenerational partnerships that we sustain. Um, obviously, the adult allies that we work with have their own lives too. Many of them have children that they um, are with, you know, while they're on meetings with us. And so all of it is just a big game of flexibility while we are holding each other accountable for um, what we're doing, we still recognize that, you know, our work is only going to progress forward if, if we're generous to one another um, and respect our limits as we continue the work we do. Thank you to the three of you. Um, thanks so much for being on this panel, for sharing your voices and your stories and for the work that you're continuing to do in your communities, not only to help to uh, develop civic skills in your classmates, but also to affect systemic change uh, in the face of uh, inequitable uh, public education and systems and other other policies. Um, with that, I will pass it back off to Jay uh, from Citizens and Scholars. Thank you, Andrew. A big virtual round of applause to Andrew and all of our panelists for a really great conversation today. I know we're just at our time, so stay tuned to your inboxes because we want to keep our conversation going. We're actually partnering with Kentucky Student Voice over the summer to co-create a case study on how they transition to be more of a youth-led structure. We actually want people from the webinar audience today involved in that process. So look to your inbox for details from today's like recording and the slides and all that, but also details on how we can follow up with each other from here. So thanks again for everybody joining and have a great rest of your day.